60% of pastors are reported to have high blood pressure. 60% are overweight. 70% report of themselves that they fight constant depression. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. The Bible reads, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. We're going to read three total scriptures here, and then we're going to go nice and slow and ask God to deal with us, speak to us, teach us. Amen. Reach us tonight, Lord. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work and live in peace with each other. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. We'll read these and we'll ask the Lord to speak to us tonight. So Christ himself gave the apostles and Christ himself gave the prophets and Christ himself gave the evangelists and Christ himself gave the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that his own body may be built up. Amen. And when you read it like that in detail, you get a better picture of just how lovely, how important, how wonderful these gifts are and what they mean to us. Amen. Our lesson, our message tonight is, oops, God left the price tag on. When you give a gift, you got to take that price tag off so they don't know what it cost you, but Amen. Christ himself gave pastors and teachers. Christ himself gave the fivefold ministry to the church. And oops, God left the price tag on. There's a price that the ministry must pay to do what God has called them to do for you and in your life. And that's what we're going to focus on here tonight. I started to read a book called 70. And it was about... Um, the way that God broke down um, two leaders to Moses and and in the early church, how they should uh, divide responsibilities because it was going to be too much for Moses' hand. When he went to Jethro, Jethro gives him this uh, advice and wise advice on uh, you're going to wear yourself out. And so uh, this book was about is about building a team. And going into just the first few chapters, it quickly spoke to me and gave me a new insight and a new respect, amen, a deeper respect, I would say, for, amen, the ministry and the ministry that is in our lives, hallelujah, that works in our lives. And the gift that God has given us, amen, something that we often take for granted. This is just the way the church has always been. God's given us these gifts and uh, it becomes routine to us, but uh, to understand the sacrifice that it takes and the heart that it takes, amen, to care for God's own sheep, hallelujah. When he asked Peter, um, the, the main qualification for what he was calling him to was, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Yeah, I know, but, but do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Yeah, I know. But do you love me? And then Peter began to feel that, that choking and began to tears swell up in his eyes. And Lord, you know I love you. And then feed my sheep. And it was, it was that, that desire that God had, the, the care and the handling that he desired, amen, for the ministry to have and it's that's that qualification that heart has to be there and i thank god for amen those that are called the men of god in my life hallelujah that god is touched with that very same do you love me and express that love back to god amen and that have fed me and and guarded me and guided me i thank god for that here tonight 
Amen. Thank God for his gift. What people generally expect from a leader. I'm going to give you lots of statistics and percentages, but these were taken from uh, different uh, studies and different colleges and different independent uh, research groups on the ministry. But this is generally what people expect from a leader, not just a leader in the church. 87% expect a leader to motivate people to get involved in meaningful projects and activity. 78% expect a leader to be directly involved in negotiation of compromises and resolve conflicts as they arise between people that follow them. They expect a leader to be able to to settle differences between people that follow. 77 ex- percent expect a leader to determine a specific course of action for the optimal outcome in their life. They need they expect a leader to give them step by step directions on how to maximize the outcome of their life. 76 percent expect a leader to identify a course of action that is most beneficial to society. They expect a leader to make the world a better place. 75% expect a leader to invest their time and energy into training more leaders to bring a vision to reality. 63% want leaders to communicate that vision so they know specifically how to operate in getting uh, where they need to be in that vision. 61% believe that leaders are responsible for the direction and production of all people associated with the cause. They, they believe that a leader should micromanage them. 56% hold leaders responsible for holding together the day-to-day details of the operation. That's just what generally our society expects from leaders in the workplace, in any organization that you're in, and yes, that also includes in the church. But on top of that, What a church expects a pastor, and this is from other studies, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, at the end of that chapter, he says, besides everything else that I have to deal with externally, outside, in my home, in my job, in my marriage, in raising my kids, and paying bills, and everything that I have to do in my life, besides everything else that is on my shoulders, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. This is this is Paul. It's it's, as a leader, Paul's expressing all these things that I have to deal with that have nothing to do with the church at all. And on top of that, I daily deal with the pressure of my love and my concern for the church. So what a church expects a pastor to be. A pastor is expected to know his sheep personally, expected to know your birthday, your favorite cake flavor, your favorite ice cream, what car is yours, how much gas you put in it, how much money you make, your work schedule. Expected, a pastor is expected to be instantly available for crisis counseling. Moments notice. The, the sky is falling. I need to call my pastor. But what if the sky is falling for two or three people at the same time at 2 or 3 a.m.? They're expected to provide assistance for all different types of emergencies and all different types of assistance during those emergencies. CPR, financial assistance. I can't pay my bills. The lights are out. Can you help me? I'm hungry. I need a ride. My tire's flat. Somebody stole my car at the mall. And then you find out that it's really there. They're expected to train people for ministry, provide guidance, counseling, admonish and exhort the weary and the brokenhearted to lift up those hands that hang low, to do the work of an evangelist, to reach every new person. To visit every new prospect and visitors and shake every single hand. To officiate at funerals, weddings, baptisms, and dedications. To maintain public relations with the community. Maintain the discipline of the saints. Keep everybody in line. 
administrate the departments efficiently, maintain improvements, repairs, janitorial work, yard work, supplies and shopping, find time to pray, to study, to contact God for a specific timely word every single service. And that's on top of everything that a leader outside of a church is expected to do. They broke this down into a number of hours and uh, most pastors report that they work a minimum of 55, but generally 75 hours a week. I work 40, shoddy, and I'm tired. Ministerial pressure impacts health. We place so much pressure on the ministry, the gift that God has given us. We place so much pressure on them and we set the bar so high it's impossible to reach that for any person. But every day, the strength of God, the anointing of God, I can do all things through Christ. And that's why I hear the voice of Brother Arevalo we need to pray for our pastor. And I thank God for a man that that's all he said. Lord have mercy. We need to pray for our pastor. And that's a burden and a ministry in itself to just pray. Because the pressure is so much It affects health from an article that made the New York Times. Hypertension, depression, and high blood pressure rates are 10% higher than the national average for people that are in full-time ministry. Use of antidepressants is growing. In a study by Duke University of 1,700 ministers in North Carolina versus uh, everybody else in that area over a seven-year period, arthritis, diabetes, high blood pressure, and asthma was higher than everybody else in that area for people that were involved in full-time ministry. The pressure affects your physical health. 60% of pastors are reported to have high blood pressure. 60% are overweight. 70% fight constant report of themselves that they fight constant depression. 90% report working between 55 and 75 hours a week. 80% of pastors' wives feel their spouse is overworked. 80% of pastors' children feel the pressure is too unrealistic of the expectations for these children to be absolutely perfect and cite that as a main reason for a hindrance in their own spiritual growth and walk with God. They see the pressure that their parents go through and in themselves say, I could never endure that or attain to that and stop in their spiritual growth before they ever get to that place. They cite pressure from, the, they see the amount of pressure that their parents have and then the amount of pressure to reach an expectation and it hinders their own spiritual growth. We need to pray for our pastor's children. We need to pay, pray for our bishop's children. Oops. God left the price tag on. People made sacrifices. 80% feel that being in ministry affects their family negatively. 80% of pastors feel they have insufficient time with their spouse. Among professionals, full-time ministers have the second highest divorce rate with over 50% of marriages ending in divorce with the national average being under 3%. The pressure, the missing your spouse, not having enough time with your spouse, not being able to connect with your spouse, the pressure. The majority of pastors' wives state that the day their spouse entered full-time ministry as the most destructive day in their family's lives, 
And 80% would prefer their spouse chose a different occupation if they could. But God called them for a purpose. It's not, I choose this occupation, I sign up, I'm going to go work at Walmart. It's not in the same category. It's a calling of God that he puts his hand and his fingerprint on you. And I need you for this purpose. It's not just a job that you select, but you are called with a purpose and God equips them and calls them and says, I'm going to place this burden on you to love these people for me and to grow them for me and to care for them for me because I shed my blood for them and I need them to be redeemed back to me. And I want you to be the one that ushers them in. It's a beautiful calling. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, that bring great good tidings of good things. Thank you, Jesus. In a focus on the family research project, burnout is defined as exhaustion of physical or emotional strength or motivation due to prolonged stress or frustration. 70% of pastors surveyed state that they face severe emotional exhaustion or depression on a weekly basis, something that they have to fight. I mean, we, we think we have to fight it. I'm stressed out. I'm going through hard times. Yeah, we, we all do, but we, we come in, we look good. We're ironed. Got us. I mean, we got a smile on, we got a skip in our step. We've all been battling something. Paul reminded the churches that through great tribulation, you're going to enter the gates, enter heaven, enter the kingdom of God. It's with great tribulation. We're all, yes, we're going to face something. But we have it in our mind that because of the anointing, because of the calling, that they're above anything that we have to face. No, the daily pressures that you face they face with an added responsibility of caring for the churches. Thank God for the ministry. Thank God for our bishop, for Sister Richardson, for our pastor and Sister Rodriguez. Many pastors suffer burnout from emotional fatigue, citing a feeling of inadequacy. Despite all of their efforts, they are unable to meet expectations. The average length of a pastoral ministry is four years. Average length. Only one in ten pastors will retire as a pastor. The cost every day of the churches. The cost every day of you and I. Amen. That that exhaustion, the pressure. And that's pressure I added onto him. It's pressure you added onto him. Onto Pastor Rodriguez. I mean, I'm, I try not to. I hope I don't, but I'm sure he feels it. He's like, I got to go on vacation. Let's say he's putting too much pressure on me. Help him, Lord. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. I'm in NRV, I believe again. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve apostles summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. You know what busyness is? Just just busyness. Just things that you and I can take care of. Amen. That we can relieve. That we can do our part. Thank God for the gift that you've given us, Lord. Help us, Jesus, to do our part. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the gift was given for the ministry of the word, for the building up, the edifying of the church, the unification, the building up of the saints for the work of the ministry. Amen. And so the apostles gave opportunity to somebody else to be involved in the work of the ministry. 
They said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, which is top priority. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. In verse number seven, the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Amen. Because they said, we're going to take a little bit of that pressure off. I don't want to... I hope I'm not sounding mean. I'm not trying to sound mean. I'm trying to encourage us. I'm just, I'm just trying to show the price tag. Yeah. We bought on Lee Christmas presents and we we're picking out one for my wife. And Annalise's presents are already all wrapped up. And she, and she wants to pick out her own Christmas present. She wants what my wife got. And she's like, I want one for me. And I'm like, okay, well, we're going to have to send all your other Christmas presents back to afford that. And then so she went, she's been asking, and she picked out which present she wants to return. It's still in the wrapping. She don't even know what it is. What she wants to return to get the thing that she wants to pick for herself for her own Christmas present. Not knowing what the cost is, not knowing the value of it, but just... I wish I had this instead. Amen. God himself gave you your pastor. God himself gave you your bishop. And you don't know the value of it and the cost of it. And what he desires to use that man of God and that woman of God to do in your life and through you. You don't know the value of what that ministry means to you in your life. And to come against that thing that says, well, I want something else. I want to pick my own present. But I'm telling you, what dad got his baby, she's going to love. And what your father got his baby, you're going to love. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your gift, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry. Hallelujah, for the legacy. Thank you, Lord, for the generational, hallelujah, legacy that's here in this place. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry, the work, Lord, the abiding work that is here in this place, Lord, the things that you've done in this church and in our families, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Exodus, Exodus chapter 17 and verse number 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And, ordered. and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. The story comes directly after Moses is asking God, what do you want me to do about these people and their thirst? Because they are getting ready to stone me. Then he goes through, tells them to strike the, strike the rock and strikes the rock and water flows out. And immediately after that, he tells Joshua, let's go fight these guys. And I'm going to go up here. And as long as the hands were lifted, I mean, we, we read them separately when we, we preach them separately, but they're really a connecting story. And when Moses' hands were lifted up, amen, any battle can be fought, anything that came against the people of God. 
any obstacle they had to face, hallelujah, could be conquered. They didn't even wait for, uh, they didn't even wait for it. He says, hey, we're going to go, we're going to go to battle. Go pick some people. We're going to go to battle. The Amalekites attack, but Moses says to Joshua, choose some of our men and we're going to go out and fight. Amen. But as long as those, his hands were lifted up, the hands of the ministry were lifted up. Amen. They were able to conquer. Amen. And it's, it's not just about Moses, but the Bible says, lift up the hands that hang low. And we read earlier in scriptures, live peaceably together. Hallelujah. Yes, we lift up the hands of the ministry, but we need to lift up the hands of each other as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Those that work hard among you, love them because of their labor. Because Respect them because of their labor. Thank God for everyone. I do. I thank God for every one of you. Hallelujah. That are here. That just put in work. That do stuff behind the scenes. Your hands are dirty. You're tired. You've been working all day. And then you come here and you're working all night. And thank God when you come here. Hallelujah. And we lift up each other. We lift up each other's hands. And we worship together. And we ask that the spirit of God moves and sweeps through every aisle. Because we know just how much you sacrifice throughout the week. Hallelujah. And there's no reason for us to bicker and fight and point and chew. And all these other things. Our we, we want to be in one place. God, help us to get there. Hallelujah. And we don't get there by fighting each other, stepping on each other, but we get there by lifting up one another's hands. God, help us to make it there together. Hallelujah. I cannot do it without you. Hallelujah. The building of the body. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, so that he could build his body which he purchased with his own blood. That one that gets on your nerves, he purchased with his own blood. Love him, love her, love them, love they, love I, love you, who he purchased with his own blood. 